So here I am now, by 10 buying weed from my neighbor, I start hanging out with people that are smoking weed, pretending like I'm dealing it. I had some false Aurelia, this plant that has like, that looks like marijuana, I tried selling it, I got busted at school. And then I'm hanging out with people and they're like, hey, try some sprinkling some Coke on it. And so I did, and then snorting Coke, and then let's get an eight ball, and then let's bring the eight ball to church camp. And how old are you at this time? 13, 14, come home, my dad says, you're acting weird, let me smell your breath. And I was not having it. I'm like, no, let me smell your breath right now. And he raised his voice and I said, I'm out of here. I probably cussed him out. Hopped over the fence, ran as far as I could run with my skateboard. I was uh, rock bottom. I see this one guy and I start being drawn to him. My name's Mark, his name is Marcus. So I I just said one day, dude, we have so much in common. What's the difference between me and you? He just said, it's the love of God. Well, Pastor Mark, it is an honor to be here with you in California. The Lord brought us all the way out here to record your testimony. For those who don't know you, maybe have not seen you, could you just introduce yourself to those who are watching on the other side of the screen? Yeah, um, uh, you may call me Pastor, but I'm a, more of a reggae artist, I guess you could say. A producer, evangelist, musicianary is what we call ourselves. And I've had the privilege of uh, ministering in 91 nations for the last 34 years, going around the world as a musicianary and preaching the gospel to as many as possible through reggae music with my band, Christafari, with my lovely wife, Avion, and our daughter, Ziza, and, and other band members that are like family members to us. It's a blessing. Come on. Well, Mark, it's an honor, again, like I said, to have you to be here with you. Um, let's start with your with your childhood. Um, did you grow up in a in a in a Christian home? Did you know about Jesus? Tell us about your testimony starting with your childhood. My uh, mom came to Christ first, and then my mom brought my dad to a Billy Graham crusade, and he was he was all logic, and and uh, eventually, you know what? God worked something through him, um, and he gave his life. To Christ, one of the things that God used in that was my um, my mom had quite a few miscarriages before she had me, and the day that they found out that they were going to approved to adopt a kid, they then find out they're pregnant again for wow. the third or fourth time after having a bunch of miscarriages, and they said, "Well, we'll try." And so my mom was bedridden the entire time. My dad couldn't get work, so he had to go to D.C. to do work, and that was something that really led them closer to each other and closer to the Lord, and a lot of prayers went over me, as you can imagine. My mom in bed, can't get up. My older brother, who is seven years older than me, we waiting on her at six years old, and um, just a lot of a lot of intentional what, you know, what this kid could be someday, and then, of course, I came out, and I, my Mom said I was like the best kid ever for the first few years. I was, uh, I started going to church at two. By about two, we moved to where we live now, uh, near the Palos Verdes Peninsula. At that time, just kind of raised in the church. Everything was great. I was a kid that my parents loved and I loved my parents. And I remember at about four or five hearing the gospel and I prayed that prayer. And I imagine inviting this little action figure sized Jesus into my heart, like like, like Luke Skywalker was, because I was a Star Wars fan. Okay, Jesus, come into my heart. And I invited him and I prayed the prayer and I and I did feel like like something changed in me. And then I remember sharing testimonies from from stage or, or memory scriptures from stage or being in in the plays at, sta- at at church. And then I started getting into acting at school and church. And those are the good years up until about nine years old. And that's when things started to go south for me. Pretty young age to go south. But what happened was um, my dad and I have personalities that are very similar. And so I think because of that, we clashed. And uh, I, I just became more disobedient. Or and, and I think part of it is the way he was raised as well. His dad wasn't a, I love you, son, and give him a big hug, and I'm proud of you. And, and so he showed us that he loved us by working and taking care of us. And he was a scoutmaster. I was a Boy Scout. And sometimes that meant that I, as a scoutmaster's son, that I was the, if I made a mistake, I was the example. 
So that caused me to start to look for acceptance from other older figures, whether in Boy Scouts or in church or in school. I always found myself around groups of people that were two or three years older than me. In my brother's case, seven years older, he would have the neighbors come over. My parents would go out for the evening and the neighbors would bring over a bong, would bring over some beer, and I would try to fit in. I try to be cool. This is okay. This is what adults do. Okay. You know, we're told not to eat ice cream for breakfast yet. Some adults do. <laughs> we're told not to drink yet. Some adults do. Okay. Maybe I can try this. And I remember having my first beer. I hated it, but I pretended like I liked it. It was the emperor's new clothes. First cigarette from another kid from Boy Scouts coughing and <laughs> oh yeah, cool. <laughs> and then of course I wanted to be cool. So I was then encouraging others to do it. I'm at nine right now. Wow. First hit of marijuana. I didn't remember feeling anything. Who knows? It was probably backyard boogie. It probably didn't really. Got, but by 10, I was buying marijuana from my next door neighbor. I didn't realize the gravity of it. I, I think my parents, because they, I mean, they said nope to dope just like everybody did in the Reagan, Reagan era. But they didn't know the signs. They didn't have that history, that past with any of those things. And so I, it wasn't like I was raised l watching an alcoholic saying, I don't want to do that or I'm going to be like that I, or any of those things. My dad would come home and he would drink after work. He'd go, and he'd kind of decompress with a glass of whatever, gin or whatever. That was all I saw. It, it wasn't, it wasn't a bad example. It was just a, that was what men did that were, you know, in, in the seventies. So here I am now by 10 buying weed from my neighbor, then I start hanging out with people that are smoking weed, pretending like I'm dealing it. I had some false aurelia, this plant that has like, that looks like marijuana. I tried selling it. I got busted in school. And then I flunked fourth grade. I only found out years later that my mom was the reason why I flunked it, because she thought I needed to learn a lesson. <laughs> that was just because the, well, I was getting D's and F's, but I was using at the time. And I was 10, you know, I really, it didn't, I still didn't clue in. And I just got worse. And then I'm hanging out with people and they're like, hey, try some sprinkling some Coke on it. Or, and so I did. And then snorting Coke. And then let's get an eight ball. And then let's bring the eight ball to church camp. And how old are you at this time? 13, 14. Wow. Bad, bad. 15, I, I lost my virginity in Jamaica. I went to Jamaica with the family and my parents didn't know how far gone I was and they let my brother watch me. And my brother was in a fraternity at the time. He was, a, he was you know, kind of partying. And so bought some weed and, uh, you know, lost my virginity there. And that was, that was a, a, like a watershed moment for me. All the innocence is gone now. And I'm leaving Jamaica with this memory you know, I, I did something that you should only do when you're married. And now I have this soul tie with this person. I don't even know their last name and um, never see again. And I wanted something to remember, to remind me of it. And so I brought back some reggae, brought back some marijuana seeds in the cap of my, my fedora and started growing that. Had 13 plants in my parents' backyard. <laughs> we had a fairly large backyard. The plants were so big, you wouldn't think it was marijuana. And then uh, started dealing that, giving it away, you know, rolling the 10 sheet joint just for fun or making a big old tea or just, and then you're so stoned when you're harvesting, you don't even remember where you put the stuff until you find it a year later or whatever. It was just like, I was messed up. And then each time I would be smoking or dealing or giving it away to friends, they would say, hey, try this, LSD. Now I'm having a bad trip. I did LSD. Probably took about 100 hits. Let's just say that anybody gives me trouble, I am legally insane. <laughs> I've taken so much of that crud. And that stuff took me on a wild ride. Just night after night, just going like this with cigarettes in the mirror. Going through my grandma's carpet, trying to see the other world in there like it's Dr. Seuss. Just stupid, man. I was, and imagine that. You're 14 years old, you're 15 years old. You're doing this. Finally, my parents catch on. Finally, you know, I've, now I've used crack, meth, coke. I'm dealing marijuana. We've got this gang. It's not a gang. It's four guys. We called ourselves the 
ESPVN, East Side Palos Verdes Nui's. This was our gang symbol. And each person had their own thing. We were wannabes. One guy made sure we all had cigarettes. The other guy made sure we all had weeds. One guy made sure we all had Coke. He was a snowman. I was Pele. I made sure that everyone had their recommended Lely allowance. Made sure that everyone had sex regularly. And I've never shared any of this stuff in a testimony. I always kind of just say, I've tried everything that the world had, had to offer. And it's horrible. It's garbage. But, I mean, we were bad, man. Parties and... I guess what kills me now as a father of a daughter is our goal was de to deflower people, mm. if you know what I mean. That kills me now. And it was, it was an addiction, as bad as any of those other things. I was so addicted. I went to camp. My parents would make me go to camp, youth camp, junior high, high school, for seven years, summer, winter. At first, I was just smoking, and then it was weed. Then I would bring, like I said, cocaine to the camp. So the guy would be preaching. I would go into the bathroom and do a line. I'd come back with a bloody nose, and I'd hear the altar call. And you know what, though? At the end of each one of those camps, I felt God saying, come to me. And so I would pray that prayer. But just like clockwork, I would go back home. Same friends, same parties, same drugs, and I'd be worse. So eventually, when my parents really caught on, I was grounded. I mean, grounded, grounded. So I'd sneak out at night. And, and, and Mark, before you yeah. move on from there, talk to me about that, that moment of your parents catching on. Because here, here's a kid yeah. that is going to wow. children's camp and everything yeah, is yeah. all good. Mm. What was that like? I, I, never, I never really think about that. Thanks for reminding me. You know, when my parents would be out, I'd drink all their the alcohol and then puke everywhere or be at a friend's. And th that they never caught on. I think the first time they caught on was they were listening on the phone and I was talking to my friend and I said, oh, you got that tie bud or whatever. And then he said, yeah. And then my mom's like, I'm listening on the phone. And I'm like, tie dye t-shirts. <laughs> it was that. Or then I got called in by the principal's office. I had a joint roller. I had a cocaine, this thing called a bullet. So you could just go and then just, you know, it had a little valve in it. And in the, in my hat, I had a patch and I, in high school, I I had a, always had a quarter of, of cocaine in there and I would do lines in the class. And so I got caught with that stuff, with the paraphernalia, but without the drugs. And that was when they called me to the principal's office. At that point, I couldn't really deny that anything was happening. So then it was counseling. Then it was AA. It was NA. It was sitting around in a circle and talking about our feelings. It was, my dad's name is Ed. Ed, you, you can't have alcohol in the house anymore. Okay. Um, you know, Margaret, you need to. And it was just, I just shut down. I did not open up to them. I would not, you know, I was just in denial. From then on, it was them against me, and I knew what was best. I got arrested three times. Um, each time I was hanging out with older people, and each time, because of my age, they released me. First time was um, on a golf course, and it was trespassing, and what bro they called vandalism, breaking and entering, well, whatever it was. The second time, it was a grant, attempted Grand Theft Auto. And again, I live right next to a police station, so they just called my parents. I was a kid. I said, I was just playing around like in the movies. And they let me go. And then the third time, it was cocaine. And at that time, I was probably 16-ish. They released me to the recognizance of my parents. Again, thank God, no criminal record. But you can't hide from those things. You know, you swear, no, no, no. They found the dust on the mirror. We tried to sweep it off really quick when we saw the cops. But so they were, they were intentional. Then it was, you got to meet with this pastor. You got to meet with this youth pastor. You got to, you got to, you know, all these, these people were, I was the pray for the drug addicted youth, the anonymous drug addicted youth. I was that guy. It was all things were coming in like this. And as I was grounded, I would sneak out. Then I would come home. My dad would be, let me smell your breath and strip down. And, like, what are you? and you know, and I was off drinking and having sex with a girl somewhere. My parents caught me in, in bed with somebody at our house. I was stupid, man. So I was grounded, 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 grounded. But I could go for a bike ride. So first day of summer, I was 16. I go for a bike ride, go down to the beach, get drunk, hook up with the girl. Come home, my dad says, 
you're acting weird. Let me smell your breath. And it, I was not having it. I'm like, no. And he and I just clashed. Let me smell your breath right now. And he raised his voice and I said, I'm out of here. I probably cussed him out. Hopped over the fence, ran as far as I could run with my skateboard. Every time a car came, I hid in the bushes. I was done. It was over. Went to my friend's house, my drug friend's house. Lived there for a little bit until his mom said, you got to get out. Which another? Then it was party to party. And I was living the life. In summer, it's easy to do that. Not so much when summer ends. But eventually, people's parents come home. And so then I found myself sleeping on the beach, waking up with sand in my ear, homeless, waking up in, in a gutter in vomit. I was uh, rock bottom. Now I'm living in an abandoned house with a bunch of drug addicts. In Palos Verdes, there's not many abandoned houses in Palos Verdes. It's a nice area. And everybody's like jonesing. How can we, let's steal a friend's TV and go down to San Pedro and sell it for some PCP. Or let's do this or that. I'm seeing these addicts fight all the time in the house, push each other through walls, punch walls. I'm living in a, it's like a, just a concrete room that hadn't been renovated with the concrete floor and one mattress, no sheet, no pillow, just soaked in cat urine because there was wild cats around. It was horrible. Then we started following old ladies home from from the, the grocery store and waiting till they took their first bag of groceries into the house and then running and grabbing the rest. It was I couldn't I couldn't do that. I was like, this is not right. At this time, my brother. He stopped doing anything that I was doing with him years earlier. He became a missionary, and he's in Alaska. So I feel betrayed kind of by him, you know. He used to be the guy I'd pop into his room and tell him my feelings, and now he's gone, and he's with Jesus, and it was just weird. But I remember him writing a letter to me. That was kind of an impetus for me to think about going home. And uh, my parents eventually, when they found out where I was, they had police looking for me, firemen looking for me. Everybody was hunting me down, trying to find out where I lived, or if I was all right. I, you know, now it's pray for the runaway youth in the church bullet. And I was the kid. They prayed for me a lot. My parents were in a Bible study group for 35 years straight. Oh, those guys prayed for me. God bless them. They're now my supporters, by the way. <laughs> um, my parents finally found me, reached out to me. At about that time, I realized that I couldn't steal to make a living, and I couldn't live the way I was. I was 16 with no work experience, so I got a job working as a janitor's assistant. At first, I thought it was cool, but then I realized it was an elementary school, and you don't want to know what kids do with poo in bathrooms in elementary school. The sinks, and they clog everything with those big brown paper towels, and then it's just so the floor is covered in floaties, if you know what I mean. And and the guy's like, yeah, I'm not doing this. This is your job. So every day I got the job that the janitor didn't want to do. And that that point, that was my prodigal son moment. That was my the toilets in my parents' house just so much cleaner. The food, the fridge in my parents' house is so much more full. And my parents said, come home, son. And so I did. And I'm so glad I did. And that in many ways was like the predecessor to my real coming home. And how old were you at that time? At that time, I was 16 and a half. Wow. At that point, they they first said, just take out your earrings. That's all you got to do. And uh, so I did. Of course, I got them back in. Sorry, sorry, folks. And then it was, oh, no, you can't use drugs in our house. And I was like, oh, I don't remember hearing that. And they, they, they first they wanted me safe, and then they started battening down the hatches and, and it, you know, started to really make sure that, and all of a sudden I'm like, ah, oh, I feel like I'm a prisoner again. So I'm doing my junior high, uh, I mean, my junior year in high school, you know, I'm still the guy partying. I'm having to take piss tests all the time now. Sorry, urine t- tests. <laughs> and um, trying to figure out creative ways to to pass them with friends coming over and Use giving me their urine or whatever. And then my parents are like, oops, we accidentally spilled it. We need another. <laughs> I'm like, oh, hey, I couldn't fool them. But something happened right before my senior year of high school. I had a desire and my parents were very smart. They used this desire to their, to God's glory. <laughs> I wanted to go to Hawaii with one of my party friends. When we were, I was about eight years old, nine years old. We went to Hawaii as a family. For me, that was like, my favorite moment in my family 
childhood history, as I recall back. We had this, you know, the, the book with all the photos. That was the one. That was the highlight. So I wanted to go back there, and I especially wanted to go back there because of Pakololo, because of the Kona gold, because of the ganja, the, the weed. My parents said, no, you can't go. I said, please, 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 I want to go with my friend. And they said, only if you go to this camp. I'm like, throw in a bodyboard and Hawaii, and I'll go to the camp. I was a good negotiator. My mom always said, you're either going to be a really good salesman, a lawyer, or a convict, a criminal. <laughs> I think I was all of the above sometime. So I said, okay, I'll get into a camp. You know, I'd done many camps. Summer camp's only a week. This one was two. Hmm. The, all of the ones were up in like Big Bear, like right next to where we're at. This one was in Northern California. Hmm. All the other ones were with my friends. I could bring one drug friend. I, you know, misery loves company. This one was alone. Hmm. But I, I really wanted to go to Hawaii. So I did. And now I'm surrounded in a school bus with a bunch of Christians singing of his love forever. And it's annoying. I'm so annoyed by these Christians. For me, they're plastic. They're fake. They have happy, love, joy. I didn't have that crap. I had a girlfriend that would supposedly make me happy when I got back. The night before, I go to this camp. I had sex with my 30-year-old vocal instructor. Got drunk with her. Never told anybody that. I am not proud of that. But that's just how far off I was, how far gone I was before I went to the camp. But I'm going to tell you the after. I got to tell you the before. And this is... This isn't the 700 Club version. This is the real version. <laughs> this is the, the unadulterated, don't have your kids watch it. But yeah, so I go to this camp and I'm like trying to find the like-minded, the dark to hover into. And I see this one guy and I start being drawn to him. And he's he's got his own shed, his own like little shack that he's in. And my name's Mark. His name is Marcus. He has a pet tarantula. I'm playing with this you know, this venomous thing. It's, And we're listening to the same music. My favorite band, Steel Pulse, is his favorite band. I'm like, dude, this is awesome. And then we start sharing testimonies. You weren't a gang too? No way. You got arrested for coke? No way. And we start sharing these things. And I'm like, dude, you're me. We're like maybe the same age a year apart or something. Turns out he was up there because he was running because people wanted to get him. And I'm like, dude, this guy's awesome. But then something hit me. He's like me in the past, but he's not like me in the future. There was a glimmer, a glow, a light in his eyes, similar to the light that I see in your eyes right now as you're interviewing me. He'd seen something. So I said, just said one day, dude, we have so much in common. What's the difference between me and you? Now, my parents, I said earlier, my parents had made me sit down with pastor after pastor after pastor. And dude, walls were up. Nobody was getting through. Didn't matter what they threw at me. They would have me sit down every single week and listen to Dr. James Dobson, Focus on the Family cassettes. Nothing was getting through. I was a fortress. But from the inside, I could open up that vault and let someone in if I wanted to. And on that very moment, I let him in. Say, what's the difference between you and I? And he didn't give me that sermon. He just said, it's the love of God. And he didn't lean in and start preaching at me. It was like a, a lozenge I was sucking on for the rest of the night. The next day, I hear the story. It was an embellished prodigal son story. It was a modern day version. This guy had done the drugs that I had done. This guy had slept around. This guy had run away. And come home like I'd come home, but had I really come home? And that was the, the moment. And I'm pretty sure the evangelist at that camp, J.H. Ranch up in Northern California, I'm pretty sure that day he's like, huh, pretty small turnout. Only a few people came forward. No, that one guy with the little wannabe dreads, the tie-dye shirt, and everything he's wearing is red, yellow, and green. But when I came forward, I remember following it at this, I was on a rock, on my knees, just weeping. And I just said, I'm done. I reached the end of myself. I said, I can't do it on my own. I need you. I am done with this sin. Going to break up with my girlfriend when I get home. I am not going to do this anymore. I believe it was genuine, but I'd prayed something like that before many times.
So then I go to this guy, Marcus, and I say, dude, I did it, man. I prayed the prayer. I'm so excited. And and I was expecting that um, Philippians 4.13 pat on the back, you know. You can do all things. Good for you. The high five. Then he pulled open the scriptures. And I'm like, ooh, what's he going to say? And he's talking about an evil spirit going out of a man and going into the wilderness. I'm like, that's dark. Then coming back to the man and finding him swept clean, empty, and put in order, and then going back and getting all his wicked brothers and coming back and dwelling in him. And I'm like, dude, what kind of buzzkill is this, man? You're supposed to give me a high five. You're supposed to give me an attaboy. And he said, no. He said, the key verse in here is empty. If you are empty when you leave here, you're going to be worse than you were before. And that's what happened. That was the difference between the cigarette to the weed, to the weed, to the cocaine, the cocaine, to the LSD, to the meth, to the crack, to the opium. Every time I prayed that prayer, I would end up being like the dog going back to my vomit and worse with the same friends, same parties. So I said, so what do I do? Well, you can't be empty anymore. Well, what do I do? You got to read the word every day, every day, 21 days straight, make it a habit, quiet time with God, you and him, You fill up. And I did. Think the first day that I broke of that stride was about two years in. That's not a look at me, glory to me thing. That's how committed I was of, I'm going to do this. And something magical happened in that. I remember hopping from rock to rock at this camp afterwards, just me and God talking. You know, I'm trying to make, like, what do I do? Okay, I got to break up with my girlfriend. I got to call my parents. Got to tell them. I get this letter from my dad. With his whole testimony, he, he never opened up to me like that before, about how he came to Christ and how he wished that I had. And I got to call him and say, I did. And I just got baptized right here in the pool. And they were just over the moon excited. Then as I'm hopping from rock to rock, I f- felt like one rock was Jesus. And then as I hopped to the next one, my favorite thing was reggae, man. I brought it back from Jamaica after I lost my virginity. I started singing about it when I was growing my plantation. I used to sing about how I was a white man Rasta, native Californian. If you had a joint that you don't want, that I will smoke it for you, man. I was that dude. I was the life of the party. The guy who was literally in my high school yearbook. It says the next, somebody was next Donald Trump, the next Michael Jordan. I was the next Bob Marley <laughs> in my high school yearbook. I just, <laughs> and... Here I, here I was singing songs about weed, and I was drawn into Rastafari in my years of using drugs because they were singing about, ja, about Jehovah, but they were also saying it's okay to smoke weed. So I was like, great, the religion of my choice, of my parents, kind of, and the weed of my choice. But now I felt Jesus was saying, no, you put Jesus and reggae together. Jesus reggae, Christian reggae, gospel reggae. That was it. That's what I was going to do. I was going to do Christian reggae. So I come home from the camp. Before I even unpack or anything, I get a call from the high school youth pastor saying, hey, I just heard you came back from JH, and I want you to share your testimony. My parents never called him. I don't know who called him. I don't know how they how he found out. But not even one Sunday comes, and I'm already sharing my testimony for all the junior hires. I was pretty pretty blunt about some of the things I used to do. <laughs> a little too too uh, honest. But then they're like, hey, you want to go to another camp? In two weeks, we have another camp. I go, sure, I'd love to. I forgot about Hawaii. Didn't even care about it anymore. When I got home, no longer was I grounded. No longer did I have a curfew. My parents just gave me grace, praise the Lord. And I ran and I used it as a rope to rescue others rather than tying a noose. So I'm at a camp and I sit down and have my quiet time and the the cabin leader for my cabin was the bassist for the worship team and a rock band. And these guys were like, you know, they were cool. And so I then uh, wrote a melody during my quiet time. It's like, I got this idea. And then I hear that there's a talent show. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Hey, you think you guys can do reggae? We can try. And the bassist looked at me and he said, you're not a Rastafarian anymore. You're a Christafarian. And that was it. Two weeks into giving my life to Christ, I was committed. I broke up with the girl. I was good with my parents. I was now sharing my faith. And now I'm singing on stage at this talent show. 
They loved it so much. I go back to church and they're like, hey, sing it on stage at church, at a youth service, in front of the whole congregation. I did. That drug friend that I did all those drugs with, I tried my best to connive him into the kingdom the night before. Got him to pray the prayer, but I think I just forcefully did it. I was such a diehard, zealous evangelist, but he joined me on stage that night. It was one of those moments where I was like, okay, this is it. Then my youth pastor said, if you're serious, well, let's go and do this at your church, at, at your school. So I did it for my high school. They teased the crap out of me saying, sorry, can I say that? <laughs> they teased the crud out of me. <laughs> uh, they said, oh, so you're not a, a, a dope dealer anymore. No, I'm a hope dealer. Uh, you're a Jesus freak back before it was cool. I embraced it. We played a concert at the school. I saw 30 of my friends come to Christ. Wow. Started a Bible study group with all these ex-druggy guys. The funny thing is all the things my parents made me listen to and sit through with all these AA meetings and all this stuff, all of a sudden, it was it was a rotodial. I could just pull from it at any time. Because even though I put up those walls, it didn't return void. And now I was a rescued that has now become the rescuer. And now I had a mission. Save my friends. The band said, hey, yeah, this is cool for, you know, the final show was my birthday, 18th birthday. We did a whole concert. And then he's, they're like, this is going to be our last. We want you to put together your own band. And my youth pastor's like, if you're serious, you should go to Bible college. You need to get doctrinally sound. And so first thing I did after graduating from high school, go on a missions trip to Jamaica, start evangelizing all the Rastas, going smuggling Bibles, bringing them backstage, and giving them out to every artist, thinking, I'm going to get one of them saved, then they're going to change the industry. Hmm. And we saw a few saved, some big ones, some famous ones. Even Damien Marley prayed the prayer with us, Pato Bantan, others. But the problem was they didn't have the discipleship, the accountability, the, the follow-up. And no matter how many times I would reach out to them, tour life is not an easy way to do it. And each time they got picked off by the crows or the thorns or the thistles, the weeds, and it was tough. All the while, I feel God was saying, yeah, you think the solution is these people coming to Christ. You're going to be the artist. If I had one goal, it would be to do Reggae Sunsplash. First tour, Reggae Sunsplash. We did it. 46 cities, 53 days. The lead artist, Buju Bantan, tried to stab me with a knife three times because of my stance of who Jesus is. It was hardcore. It wasn't easy, but we stayed the course, and we still, 34 years later, still have stayed the course. Wild ride. <laughs> Yeah. And I still do try and read the Bible every single day and encourage others to do it. Because I believe that that prayer, church, fellowship, accountability, just vulnerability, transparency with others is is how you keep that walk in a forward direction. Yeah. Mark, can you, uh, I want to just go back a little bit here to those early moments walking with God. You know, you reading your Bible and uh, really making that commitment. Yeah. You know, from an early age, I mean, at 16, you were already involved in so much. Too much. And now here comes Jesus into your life. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and, and, and I know you're giving us the sum up version of how everything yeah. happened, but can you give us a little bit more insight into the process of how God began to heal you and kind of free you from all of these things? And what was happening as you were reading the scriptures and you were getting uh, into a personal relationship with God. Part of my journey, my journey is very different than others. And I, I'm counseling people all the time who are going through rehab or, or working through the 12 steps. And for some of them, it's, it's a lifelong process. For me, it was very, very different. And I wish that I could wish it on everybody that gets delivered. But we are not always like that. I have a very addictive personality, if you can't tell. If I do reggae, I'm going to be the, I start a genre of gospel reggae. If I, you know, I, I used to do dreads. I did the best dreads for everybody. You know, whatever it was, I, I embrace it and I go all in. And so I would recommend for anybody to not, you can't halfway it. It's like being half married. You just can't do it. You just got to go all in for it. And for me, 
Jesus was was my substitution in that he took my death and and even my sins upon himself. Uh, he you know washed them clean, but in all, in other ways he's my substitution meaning that it was no longer drugs. It is now this. So like for instance you go to an AA meeting, not that I go to them anymore but I used to, you know, they're like substituting <laughs> alcohol, let's say, for nicotine and caffeine, right? And a book. Uh, for me, I was substituting Christ, substituting the world with Christ, substituting intimacy with a woman, or what I called intimacy, with uh, intimacy with Jesus that was much more lasting. And the thing that I found was that, I like to say this a lot, and I know I'm not supposed to preach here, but never trade momentary pleasure for a lifetime of regret. And it's something that I've just kind of had one way or another and one wording or another. I've had this ability to play my decision down the line. And I believe that I got the insight of that after coming to Christ. I sure as heck didn't have it before. But being able to see and realize now that, okay, if I do this, this leads to this, 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 all the way down. And so I've tried my best to use that insight, that that wisdom, um, so those early days with Jesus, I wouldn't train him for the world. And you know, the world's ahead of you. At that case, I was so young, you know, literally in my prime, 18, just turned 18. I had the world ahead of me. The crazy thing is that how many people at 17 start what they're going to do for the rest of their life. You know, so I'll see a friend from, you know, at school. And I'll be like, dude, you're a doctor. I'm so proud of you. He's like, dude, I'm proud of you. Mm-hmm. You've been doing what you were doing since high school, and you love it. You do it with your wife and your kid and your... You know, that time with God to me is just as precious today. But yeah, there is that sweet, that sweet intimacy at the beginning that's like, wow, I'm learning about him. But I grew up in the church. So, like I said, a lot of that stuff I knew, I knew, I knew. Application. Hmm. You could almost do it in one inhale. And all of a sudden, it's like, it's like Neo in the Matrix. (laughs) All of a sudden, he knows Kung Fu. I'm like, Oh, crud. All of a sudden, I know recovery because I went to all these groups wow. and I heard all these old guys for years and I, sh- I, I you know, I, tr- I shut them down, but it doesn't come back void. But obviously, the, the heart of that is the prayer of my, of my parents. And that's, that's one of the things that I like to say a lot in churches is if you're a mother, a grandmother, a parent, a concerned elder of any sort, about somebody, just never start not stop knocking and asking and seeking because God God answered with me. Yeah, are your parents still with us? They're still with us. What is their reaction, or you know, even now as they've seen what God has done through you, and obviously your ministry has taken Christian reggae to a whole different level. Yeah, of impact at the entire world. What is what are those conversations like now? as they're seeing where you're at today, or or what was it like even as it was happening? You know, I, they're my biggest cheerleaders. They're our biggest supporters, our biggest prayer warriors, uh, our best friends. I feel like all those years when I was just pushing against them, rebelling against them, I, I was such a jerk, and I feel so bad for it, and I apologize a lot, and they're like, Mark, you don't need to apologize anymore. We, we just have an intimacy and a love for each other, you know, whether we're going on vacation together or, or you know, just tonight I'm, I go from here to a dinner with them and I just, it's a love fest. I can't explain it. And there's nothing like hearing those words from my dad that he never heard from his dad. I am so proud of you, son. Hmm. And, they, you know, when I'm, whenever I'm at, wherever I'm at in the world, if it's a live stream concert, even though they've seen the concert a thousand times. They're watching and they're cheering on, and now to see their grandchild singing with me, <laughs> you know, our daughter Ziza is lead singing in music videos and stuff, and it's there's nothing like it, man. Honestly, this is this is the beginning of the happily ever after. It's the glimpse of the glimmer of what paradise is going to be like, which will be so much better. But yeah, it's sweet. It is possible to go from doing this to just doing this and having this beautiful relationship. Mark, since that moment, 17 years old, yeah, um, where you totally surrendered to God and became on fire for Him, how long has it been 
since then. Thirty four and a half years. Thirty four. You know what's crazy? It feels like last month, dude. It's a there's a, it's a zeal. There's a fire. If you fan it, the flame keeps going, dude. <laughs> it keeps going. In those last in these last thirty four years, just in a nutshell, um, you've seen the world quite literally, literally, yeah, um, reaching people through a genre that many would write off, you know, as no good. Mm -hmm. um, but you've are sharing Jesus through it. Now you're even preaching to people, and yeah. you went from being a band to really being a ministry. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk to us about these last 34 years and what you have seen God do as you've said yes to this call? Well, at first we tried to fit into the industry. That was like probably the first 10 years. We don't fit in. We don't fit in. We don't, we, we're not the kind of band that plays on radio. We moved to Nashville, tried to do the whole thing. I repented of that eventually. We're, we were the only reggae band in all of the state of Tennessee. It was just, it was cool. We had the the highlights. We signed on Toby Mac's label and toured with DC Talk and other big bands, but it just wasn't right. Something was off. And part of that was the inner workings of the band and different band members. And, and it all comes down to discipleship, all comes down to accountability, all comes down to how can two people walk together if they're not in agreement. And so we saw, I saw a big split. A lot of the band members were like, hey, you know, we don't want any more preaching. Like, uh, that's kind of what we do. We can't say Christ fire without saying Christ first. Well, yeah, we don't even like the name. I'm like, what? Yeah, we want to get rid of these band members and we want to just sing about he, him, love, and you, and peace. I'm like, that's not the band that I asked each of you to join. That's not the band that I started by myself. I'd love for you to continue on with me. But like, no, we're going to go and do our own thing. That was tough. And they went on with the label. And nobody in the industry would touch me because that label said, don't touch this guy. He's the competition. So that's, that was tough. But God used that to have us start our own label with a different distributor. And then it was no longer industry standard. It was ministry standard. We're going to be a ministry. You know what? We're not going to compromise. We're always going to preach the gospel, no matter what. I always said that. But now I don't have anybody that's going to try and keep me from doing that. So for a while, we did that. And then I felt God was saying, I want you to go even deeper. And now it's no longer ministry standard, it's mission standard. Now, you're not going to focus on the first world nations that can afford to bring you out. You're not going to focus on the honorariums in order to go. You're going to go, and I'm going to provide as you go. Wow. And that happened when we were in New Caledonia flying to a little island called Lifu that nobody's ever heard of before. And that was when he's like, yeah, this is, this is where the Toby Max and the uh, Hill Songs and all these other guys will never go. These are the places I want you to go. These are the places reggae is king. This, this is the gospel. The gospel we preach to every nation, and then the end will come. This is the great commission, not the great suggestion. And so I said, okay. And um, the last split brought us down to three people, and everybody else went secular pretty much. And then I said, okay, to the guys, here we are. God's told me we're going to become missionaries. By this day, we're going to be, I want each of you to raise funds. And from then on, we're not getting paid. We're just going to go and trust. And by that day, we lost everybody but three, my wife and our keyboardist, Justin. And we started again, a remnant rising, like uh, Gideon's, Gideon's army. I wouldn't trade that for the world because that was when the 91 nations came about. Each year, we do about 20 nations in the last seven months, we've seen about a million decisions. That was seven years, we've seen about a million decisions for Christ. Wow. All glory to God. Nothing to do with me. It's all about Jesus. But it all came about through that one guy giving that modern-day rendition of the prodigal son when I was 17. And um, me saying yes. No more to sin. Yes to him. Mark, who is Jesus to you? My best friend, my inspiration, my muse, my he makes my soul sing. He's the only one who satisfies my soul. Everything I tried, all the things that gave me temporary joy, left me emptier than before. But with Jesus, I say there's no high like the most high, but man, there really isn't. There's no buzz. There's, there's no buzz kill, should I say. There's no no regret afterwards. It's um, 
the path of least resistance and the most beautiful wake of, imagine a bed of flowers following you everywhere. You know, his goodness and mercy follows me. It is not easy. And following him is the path of greatest resistance in the world. But he's my all in all. And I do my best, my best to find success in the world. And success in the world is not found in the world. It's found out of this world. And it's not found in Grammys. It's not found in number one albums. It's found in Jesus saying, well done, my good and faithful servant. And um, I try to funnel everything I do in life through that, through how what I do now will be received in heaven, not how it will be received here. And ultimately, how many people I can bring there, because that's the only thing you can really change. I don't know why God has chosen us, but we're the the, the team that nobody knows about, that <laughs> we're the, the secret SEAL team <laughs> going in and setting up in these random places and seeing these, these massive harvests and just be like, what is God doing? I'm blown away by him every day. We just confirmed Uruguay. I never thought I would go there. Uruguay, what the heck? God is so good. Mark, for those who are watching and desire that that fire that they see in you, or they yeah. desire that enthusiasm to share the gospel, mm-hmm. to go out and do what God is telling them to do, um, could you just give a word of encouragement to those who uh, don't know how to get there and they just feel lost and don't know how to get on fire for Jesus or don't even understand how that happens? What's a word of encouragement that you would give them watching? We say uh, the same thing every night after I give the altar call, after I give a call to salvation. We encourage people, the person who prays with Jesus, stays with Jesus, P-R-A-Y-S. First thing, it starts with prayer. It starts with actually talking with Him. And, and that means an honesty, an intimacy. We're going through Psalms right now, and um, sometimes it's crying out, sometimes it's shouting at Him, but it's keeping that communication going. And it's uh, it's a lot of listening, but it's a whole lot of talking too. And then the R, reading the Bible. This is something I've really, really been harping on lately. I, I would challenge anybody, just after you watch this, go and read Psalm 1, and then go and read Joshua 1. Read those two and look for the parallels on meditating on His Word, on His law, day and night. And, and what happens when you do the promises of the, the abundant life, the, the fruit, the like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And, um, and just the end result of that is just undeniable. And man, I counsel a lot of people. They're struggling with porn. They're struggling with this addiction or that struggle. And the one thing that corresponds with that, when they're having a bad day, they're not spending time with God. And when they start having those victories is when they've gone 14 days straight spending time with God. There's something about that. They say the Rastas, I don't, I'm not a Rasta, but they say a chapter a day keeps the devil away. I don't know if it's necessarily true, but it's definitely part of the walk. Pray, read, attend church. You can't do it on your own. Find a group, a body of believers. YouTube is awesome. We've got videos up there. Christ of I Band, all kinds of music videos. These testimonies are awesome, but this is not fellowship. you got to be a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. And not just attending church, but being a part of a small group is probably even more important. A group of people that will look you across the table. I just had a lunch, just came from it, where you look somebody across the table and you say, how are you doing in your area of weakness? And you're transparent with each other. And then yielding to the Holy Spirit, that is, for me, putting Jesus first. I sign that as an autograph all the time. Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So letting him go first, letting him take the lead, not saying, no, this is my way, let's go. Say your way to Yahweh. And then lastly, sharing that faith. And I think that's where the zeal continues because as you're dealing with new believers that are just coming to Christ, it reminds you and it gives you a freshness and you're no longer stale anymore. It's I don't know how it's possible for 
piece of stale bread to get in, in between a loaf of good bread and get, get good. That doesn't happen with bread, but it can with Christians. And, and, and part of that, that sharing is going. So I think everybody should do at least one mission trip somewhere. And that is a real fire. When you start to see the zeal of, of a Brazilian or a Kenyan for, the, for Jesus, you realize, wow, we suck here in America. We've got to step it up. This Jesus is real. Imagine what it's like in an underground church in China. You know, imagine what you can learn from a 24-hour service where they're just like practically worshiping the word because they just love it so much and we don't even care. How often does your pastor even preach from it anymore? So there's something about that zeal and 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 sharing and and yeah. I guess Christians are like fertilizer. We're only good when you spread out. <laughs> if we pile together, we stink. <laughs> So go and share. And, and when you do that, pray, read, attend, yield, and share. For me, that's, that's my method of, of keeping it fresh, of, of circulating that, that water so that it doesn't become like this stagnant swamp. Something's pouring into you, someone's pouring into you, and you're pouring out to others. Hmm. Mark, could you pray for those who are ready to answer the call? for those who are ready to follow Jesus, to lay down their lives. Um, could you just pray for them as they're watching right now? That's why I'm here. That is why I'm here. That is the only reason why I'm here. And I'm so excited I get to do this. If you just watch this and you're like, I want what he has, your relationship with Jesus is going to manifest in a different way than mine. And how you work through all these things that are in your past is going to manifest in a different way. But the God of all creation loves you so much that he died for you so that you could live for him. And he wants to live with you eternally, but you can't get to heaven unless you've been forgiven. And so that's something you can't do on your own. You have a part in it. You repent. You ask forgiveness for your sins. I'm not proud of any of the things I was just shared. In fact, before we even did the interview, I'm like, dude, should I tell this stuff? Because I feel bad about it. You should feel bad about your past. But know that God will give you a whole new future. So just bow your head right now and just tell him you're sorry for your sins. Tell him you have missed the mark that his plan for you is holiness and living right and you have failed. You don't need to recount every single sin, but you do need to be sorry for it. And you have to be willing to turn away from it. You have to be willing to, to literally say, God, I'm going in the opposite direction. And that direction is you. And if you're at that place right now, pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Cleanse me. Make me new. I repent. You died for me. I will live for you. You rose from the dead. Raise me up out of this mess. Give me eternal life. I call upon your name. Save me. Give me heaven. I am forgiven. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, as I'm praying that right now, I am higher than I ever was on any drug I ever used. I am floating right now, better than using nitrous oxide while listening to Dub Side of the Moon. I am lit by Christ, and I pray that you are on fire for Christ. But when you have that feeling, when you get those goosebumps, it doesn't always last. So you got to keep using, and that using is the word. Prayer, church, sharing your faith. Go therefore. Hey, everybody. I hope the new testimony has blessed you, has encouraged you. Just wanted to let you know that if you are in need of help, that we have people that are ready to speak with you. So down in the description box below, in the comment section, uh, if you're watching from YouTube, if you're listening from our podcast, just look for the link that says, Talk to someone who cares. Click on that, fill out the form, and somebody will get in contact with you locally. 
Now, this is only available to people in the U.S. right now, but we are working to get resources for our international viewers and listeners. But for right now, if you are in the U.S. and you need help, you need to talk with somebody, please fill out that form and somebody will reach out to you. God bless you, and we'll see you on the next testimony.